Good evening. I greet you in the name and the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I'm glad to see you all on this beautiful evening together as we commemorate the Last Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples, with us who are his modern-day disciples. One thing I need to share with you is that uh, tonight we will be partaking of communion. Those of you who are worshiping at home this evening, uh, please gather your communion elements, what will pass for communion elements for you, so you'll be ready when the time comes. Uh, for those of you in the room, we will be partaking of communion in the way that we have become accustomed to in the last few months. And that is that you'll come to the communion railing, you'll kneel if you're able, and you'll receive the, the bread into your cup hands, and the, and the filled cups are here on the communion railing. After you have partaken of both the bread and the cup, on your own, it, it will not be by cue. You you will put the, the empty cup on the last row, the one closest to here, so we don't get them confused as to which are full and which are empty, because sometimes people don't empty them all. That's a strange little thing you have to worry about these days. Now, uh, the last thing I want to share with you is there is a sunrise service on Sunday morning uh, with our friends at Oak Grove Church of the Brethren in their outdoor space, I invite you all and tell all your friends to come and enjoy uh, the celebration of the resurrection first thing in the morning at early dawn, which is when uh, they went to the tomb to, to discover uh, that the tomb was empty. Not quite early dawn, but close. 7 a.m. and then our regular service is at 9 with Sunday school in between. Those are all the announcements I'm going to make. The service this evening is a beautiful, profound service, and so I invite you into a spirit of contemplation, meditation, as we worship together. We have been on quite a journey during Lent. We have put ourselves in the stories of Holy Week for some time now because they are important to our faith journey as followers of Jesus. What we've done is we've freeze-framed moments, very powerful moments during Holy Week so that we might put ourselves in the picture. And when we put ourselves in the picture, we learn and grow spiritually together. Let us enter the passion of Jesus. Tonight, the characters we have experienced by zooming into the works of art will step into our picture. We'll hear from them again, but this time they come to us knowing the rest of the story. Some of you may remember Paul Harvey's radio show where he would set up a, a dilemma, but after a commercial break, come back and tell us the rest of the story with a strange little twist of one kind or another. And that's essentially what we will be doing this evening. Holy Week is a time to mourn the continued suffering in the world. But we do so knowing the surprising twist in the story of Jesus. We are Easter people as we live in the post-resurrection era that reminds us that suffering and death 
is overcome when we follow Jesus' command to be agents of change in a world that so desperately needs a resurrection hope. now travel back to the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life before the parade. Remember me? I was the one on the ledge overlooking the parade of Jesus. I was fascinated with what I had heard about Jesus and perhaps downright scared. But I showed up outside the gates to the city that day to watch his entrance. And then things got more intense in Jerusalem that week. I don't even think intense covers it. It was horrifying. Roman executions are always gruesome, but this one held the message of, see what we do with saviors. The morning of that parade, the crowd was chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us. As if a man on a donkey could free us from this fascist and oppressive Russian regime, Roman regime. Looking back on it in hindsight, it turns out that the donkey was part of his message. Fighting evil with the ways of evil, answering might with might, just cannot be redemptive. But coming into the picture and showing a different way to have power, the way of mercy and compassion, nonviolence and forgiveness, that is the response that God requires. And it changes all things. Because in the end, no matter how death-dealing things are, no matter how loud the voices of hatred and fear are, resurrected life comes in the light of love. As we use our lives to show a different way to be in the world, this is the rest of the story. Violence, I invite you to think about something that has your heart gripped in fear or even loathing. Ask Jesus to save you from it and show you a different way. pray. Jesus, Savior on a humble donkey, empty us of our need for revenge, answering hatred with hatred. Let your compassion be our compassion. Amen. And now I'm going to ask you to do something unusual. I'm going to ask you to stand where you are, as you're able, and turn and face the back. Actually, the front doors, front doors that are leading to the outside world. I want you to notice the beautiful stained glass image of Jesus. Jesus is leading us out into the world. When the music is complete, you may be seated facing forward.
I was filled with fear and frustration. I was afraid he was about to get himself killed. And well, he did. It was the risk he took. And in doing so, he showed us that just pursuing justice is risky. Still is. You've seen many bold and righteous leaders cut down since my time. I was so angry at the events that unfolded that week angry at the way things are. Yes, it's part of the redemption story to feel anger at the way things are and to try to do something about it. But I know it's hard to see whether anything we do makes a difference when the pain continues. I certainly felt there was no hope that week in Jerusalem, especially as we watched our beloved one die on that Roman executioner's cross. But then, there was the rest of the story. And what rose up out of that death was something that gave us all courage to live on and spread the news that death will not win. And as I see you standing here, and as I see you sitting here, I know that what truly lives on has more longevity than any political power in any one era. You, and you, and you are part of my story. You are part of Jesus' story. And that is the long arc of justice. In another moment of silence, I invite you to imagine that your actions towards a more just world, small though they may be, are part of the rest of the story for humanity. Ask Jesus to show you what you can do, what you can do out in this world to be a part of the picture of justice. Let us pray. Jesus of righteous indignation, give us courage to be a part of the arc of justice that you proclaim. Let your passion be our passion. Amen. As Jesus taught in and around the temple during that holy week, so we have learned from the story of Jesus, symbolically transporting ourselves into the story so that we may learn and grow in our faith together. Let us experience the rest of the story through drama. I'm the one who was in charge of keeping an eye out on uh, Jesus whenever he showed up at the temple to teach that week. And it was fascinating to see how the crowds adored him. But then, when it looked like he really was going to get into serious trouble, how some people really got frightened and they started staying away from him. They even turned on him. But I have to say, if if you're someone whose life depends on towing the line, uh, holding your true feelings, or
true identity for fear of punishment, it is not an easy thing to stay strong, that's for sure. Fear is a powerful thing. Fear keeps us all small and sometimes silent when we should be speaking up. Fear is a terrible master. I even saw some of Jesus' closest friends, his disciples, deny they knew him after the crucifixion. Even the best of us succumbs to fear, no doubt. And I can tell you that even as a Roman official, I felt the fear that night as he was dying. What has become a, well, what has become of our society in which a teacher, a rabbi, a nonviolent person, if you will, is deemed such a threat that the state cannot tolerate them, that they must be extinguished? Are we so fragile that we cannot even engage one another without resorting to death? Well, this seems to be a question for your time and, and perhaps for all time. Can the rest of the story in that fateful week allow us some hope that we can rise again, rise above and rise up from the ashes of our own dysfunction? Another moment of silence. And this time I invite you to image, imagine what it would be like to transform the way that we deal with our differences. Ask Jesus to teach your heart to love someone who is different from you. Someone that you struggle to understand. Let us pray. Rabbi, teacher, Jesus, teach us to love beyond our differences, to look closely at how we might change the rest of the story. Let your understanding be our understanding. Amen. Just as much happens at our dinner tables day by day and when we gather with our families around holidays like this one coming up, so much took place around tables in that holy week. At the first supper, Jesus is blessed by a woman anointing Jesus with ointment, which is an extravagant gift love. Let us hear the rest of that story. gathered around the table. Just like the time the disciples used to eat with Jesus and whatever unexpected guest he had invited. I told you the story of the woman who came in that night, last week, with the expensive oil. And how she, we complained to Jesus about the, the cost of it. We were concerned about money and survival. And then Jesus reminded us that money and survival are not the most important thing in the world. Actually, how we spend our time and how we spend our love while we are here is the thing we should be concerned about. And then the rest of the story happened. He was right. She was preparing him for burial. We did see his earthly body violated, tortured, and killed. And we did tend his body in the ways it is done with burial oils and linen cloths before laying him in the tomb. 
In fact, it was Luna and Lat Raps left behind three days later that gave us the evidence that the tomb could not hold him. Death could not hold him. It makes me wonder what linen wraps cover our own eyes right now so that we cannot see the true present blessings right now. How much does our worry about the future steal from the present that we have before us right now? In the silence, I invite you to recall the blessings of your life right now. Ask Jesus to help ease your worry of the future so that you can live your life fully right now. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, anointed one, open our eyes and help us shed the death cloths we are already wearing in order to see the light of new life in every single day that we have. Let your abundant hope be our abundant hope. Amen. At this point in our journey, we'll take a moment to reflect on the events of, of Holy Week and what we've learned along the way. Are the things that you've learned through this journey over these past six weeks, things that you've been inspired by during Lent as we have freeze-framed these events during Holy Week? Or perhaps something has come to you tonight that you would like to give to God and give thanks for? What are you convicted to do and to say because of what you have learned over these last few weeks of how you have put yourself into the story, that wondrous story of Holy Week? Think on these things in silence as we prepare our hearts and minds in a few moments for the Last Supper of Jesus which we recall every time we come to the Lord's table. My life since that night in the upper room was never the same. As the servant assigned to the room, I witnessed an amazing act, an act of servanthood unlike anything I had ever known. The honored guest took my towel and wrapped it around his waist and took on the duty of washing feet. That was my lot in life, my station, one that was supposed to define my life forever. Everyone in the room was stunned, but Jesus didn't stop there. He went through more of the rituals of Jewish meals, adding in strange words and prophecies that had everyone on edge. Turns out he knew what he was doing, for his words became eerily true. As we all witnessed the breaking of his body, and the pouring out of his blood in the days after the meal, he dared speak of a new way of being in relationship, where all people are of sacred worth, of equal stature. 
and this was such a threat to the status quo that he was killed for it. But here you are, and I see now that the rest of the story shows up whenever you gather around tables where all are invited to be present and to feast on the love and grace that is each person's birthright as a child of God. I see a vision of a time and place where even, and especially, I have a place at the table. Peace be with you. You are welcome at table here. Will you turn to one another? Don't, don't wander around the room like you often do, but just those who are near to you, say peace be with you. You are welcome here. Peace be with you. You're welcome here. As we come to the Lord's table this evening, I invite you to reflect on the amazing gift that God has given to us, the gift of salvation, the gift of hope, the gift of new life, abundant life, forgiveness of sins. It's all bound up in this holy meal. There are a number of places where you'll respond during the uh, receiving or during the preparation this evening, so be prepared. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. May love and grace be with us all. Let us lift our hearts up to our God. It is right to give our thanks. Let us pray. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, divine artist, creator of heaven and earth. Your brush strokes evoke the whole of your palette, making all creation into your colorful images. You breathed into us the breath of life and framed us with the story of love. When we turn away and our love fades like a work of art long neglected, you restore us to original glory. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn by saying together, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, and with heaven we sing of your glory with hosannas to our God. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. You know we needed a close-up encounter with you, and you zoomed in the lens to meet us face to face. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. Holy God, your work astounds us in its power and promise. By his baptism, our call is established. By his suffering, our pain is companioned. By his resurrection, our own life is renewed. By this covenant, the Spirit lives in us. In that last week, events public and private began to lead to a moment in which he surrounded himself with his dearest friends. Who among us would not do the same if we knew our time was drawing to a close? Time stood still, life in stark relief, as he took bread. 
He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as you shall often as shall drink it in remembrance of me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. And so we remember your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. And we offer ourselves as part of the story of sacrifice and salvation. For the sake of the world, please stand if you're comfortable standing. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith, repeating after me with the hand motions too. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. I invite you now to keep your palms upward. Take a moment to be still. To freeze frame this moment. This is the rest of the story. It is here that we come to be transformed by God's grace into the beautiful story that God intends. Know that we all must do is open ourselves to receive from the master artist at this moment of all moments is at work to restore us even now. And now, O oh Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the cup. Make them be for us the love of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by this love. And now, my friends, take a look around. For as you look upon the body of Christ, you do indeed turn your eyes upon Jesus. By your Spirit, O Lord, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
gracious and holy God, as we have stopped at your table this evening, we have been blessed by your holy presence. Enable us so to live, O God, in your spirit day by day, that we may give thanks and praise with the way that we live and the way that we love. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The story for this evening concludes with the stark reading of the passion, the passion narrative from the Gospel of John. During the reading, the altar will be stripped as, as a sign of the desolation of Jesus on the cross, the desolation that he experienced for us. It will be covered with a dark cloth as it would seem that the forces of darkness will have won at that point in time. Following the reading, we will sing a hymn, as it said in the Last Supper story, that they sang a hymn and they departed. We will do the same. And then we will depart this evening in silence, without the, the typical hearty greetings with one another, at least until you're outside. But then, of course, on Sunday morning, because we know the rest of the story and celebrate the real rest of the story, which we know though those first followers of Jesus could not comprehend. In the midst of this story, I invite you to place yourself in this story. Maybe it's those who are looking off at a distance, those who are, had fled, those who'd wanted to fight, those who had betrayed or denied. Where do you find yourself in this passion of God? After Jesus had spoken the words at the Last Supper, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus also often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the, from the chief priest and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and, and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to him, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. 
Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill a word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and the other disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and war warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachings. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus in the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing, warming himself. They asked him, you are not alone, one of, one of his disciples? Are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid the ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man was not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone to you at the Passover. Do you want me to release to, for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wo wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it was given to you from above. Therefore, the one who has handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard but these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in the Hebrew, Kabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away from with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. 
Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it and see who will get it. This was to fill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says they will look on the one whom they have pierced. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the, his body. Nicodemus, who had come, first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and olives, weighing about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in this place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one has ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they lay Jesus there. <laughs> 